Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to PrepMedic. In this week's video, I'm giving you a full tour of our critical care helicopter. All right guys, so a little bit of background before we start the video. I work for a critical care transport service out here in Colorado. So we actually operate three separate helicopters and a multitude of ground units. We do both the critical care interfacility transfers, which means taking uh, really acutely sick patients from the ER to ICU, ICU to ICU, uh, and uh, to other specialties. So we do a lot of balloon pump transports, we do impellas, some ECMOs, uh, high rob so high risk OB transports where they need fetal monitoring the whole time, intubated patients uh, that are on a ventilator, or just patients that are very sick and have a lot of medications running at one time. Our crews consists of a pilot, a critical care nurse, and a critical care paramedic. So in this week's video, I'm actually going to go through this entire helicopter. We're going to start with the lead pilot giving a quick rundown of this aircraft and some of her controls up front. And then we're going to go into more of the patient care compartment along with all of the exterior compartments of the helicopter. So without further ado, let's get into the video. So we are gonna look at the airframe that we fly. This is the Airbus AS350. We also call it the A-Star, also known as the Squirrel because it's kind of a handful to hover. Um, it's got a turbo mecha engine. It's a three bladed helicopter. It has about a thousand horsepower. It's one of the best helicopters for high altitude EMS work for the fact that it leaves a smaller footprint in the mountains. A lot of our LZs landing zones that we land in are tight in the mountains near rivers on a dirt road and we can't come in there with a huge helicopter as well as it is light, very light airframe. Uh, on the skids, we have these things that are called bear paws, and that allows us to land in the snow and uh, keep the tail up out of the snow. Um, as well as this helicopter has the world record for landing on Mount Everest, so the high altitude capabilities are phenomenal. We were able to land in small areas and land at super high places. A lot of the other helicopters that have dual engines are way too heavy and they're power, actually more power limited in the mountains. All right, so these are the GPS um, modules. This is the other GPS on the other side. They cross fill each other. Engine gauges, backup uh, artificial horizon, everything you need to know about the helicopter and the panel of radios down here. And these are the controls. All right guys, so coming into the patient care area of this aircraft, uh, both sides have the same door layout, although the patient is actually loaded from the left side. Now this is a relatively small airframe, so as you're gonna see, there's not a ton of room for the patient or even the attendants. But in here, we have this one sliding door. Now what's cool about this is that we can actually open the sliding door in flight as we're coming in for a landing, if we're at an unsecured landing zone where we don't really know what the terrain is under us. Both the nurse and the medic can pop their doors, we can guard the tail rotor, make sure that's not gonna come in contact with anything. And then we can also look down and make sure that the skids are coming down on a level surface. So kind of nice that we're able to do that. Now the second door here, we can't open in flight, but this actually allows us to get the cot in and out of the helicopter. It can be opened while the rotors are spinning, so we can do what's called a hot offload or hot onload. If we do uh, want to either take the patient or take the uh, cot out while the rotors are still spinning, we can do that and same, we can load the patient in, which just makes our scene time a little bit faster if we don't have to shut the entire aircraft down. So the name of the game for this helicopter is weight management. We want everything as light as possible. In fact, for the crew members, we all have to maintain a weight under 230 pounds with our helmet and anything else we have on us. So fully loaded down uh, any more than that and we actually get grounded till we can fix that. So in here, this cot is similar to an ambulance cot but doesn't have any wheels. We can just unlock it right here and bring this out to allow for this to be taken out of the aircraft. And then we can actually separate the sled from this. And you'll see the sled is pretty light. I can lift this on my own. If a patient's on it, we either need a bed to slide this onto or back into this, or we need a bunch of people to carry the sled and actually lock it into the holder. On here, we have our what we call our first out bag or our scene bag. This bag is meant to sustain a patient for the first five to 10 minutes of any call. Uh, and I do have a video going through this in detail, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it, but I'll really quick run you through the pockets. 
Uh, this top pocket here, we have all our narcotics and our rapid sequence intubation medications. So if a patient needs an airway, uh, if they need a breathing tube put in, we can paralyze them and sedate them, and we can actually insert that with these medications. It also has all our pain management meds, so all our narcotics and benzodiazepines live up here because these are things that we use relatively regularly. In the top lid of this, in this pocket here, we've got two cat tourniquets, we've got chest seals, some minor bandages. We also have quick clot for our traumatic uh, injuries that we need to stop bleeding quickly on. Coming into the side pockets here, on this side we have uh, blood tubing, so we do carry blood products. We've got a unit of liquid plasma, and then we have two units of packed red blood cells. We're not carrying whole blood yet. And those are for our trauma resuscitations. If somebody's bleeding externally or internally, we can start administering uh, this to them. And the blood tubing is just a Y, so blood will go on one side of it, saline will go on the other. And then once the blood runs in, we can flush the line with the saline and start running another unit or start pushing meds through that line if need be. Over here, we've got an IV kit that's just in a Welsh Allen. Uh, black bag, and that IV kit has everything we need. So it's got all the sizes of your IVs, loops, flush, things like that. And then down here, we've got just a half uh, bag of saline and normal drip tubing. Nothing super special about that. Uh, we keep that on that side of the bag. And then on this side here, we have our IO. So IO is interosseous. I also have a video on interosseous access. It's a needle that goes directly into the bone that allows us to get uh, vascular access on somebody that's a really hard stick for IVs um, or that's unresponsive or in a really profound state of shock. We've got a glucometer in here. And then in here, we just have O2 administration stuff. So we carry nasal cannula and non-rebreather uh, in that side of the pocket. Now coming into the main compartment here, we have a number of different cells. So these aren't the stat pack cells. And I should mention this bag is the stat pack G3 backup. Um, it's a pretty nice pack. The outside is really easy to wipe down and disinfect. But in here, we've got a bunch of these different cells. These are made by Conterra. And this one has all our ACLS meds. So Epi, Atropine, D50, uh, Narcan, and Amiodarone are in there. And then in this guy, we've got our backup airways. So our backup adult airways are Cricothyrotomy or eye gels for a superglottic. Uh, Cricothyrotomy is cutting somebody's neck to establish that airway. And then in here, we've got our BVM with a PEEP valve and then our OPAs, MPAs, things like that. We do use a children's BVM because the tidal volume is still comparable to adults and we don't want to overinflate somebody's lungs. Down here, we've got a video laryngoscope. This is the glide scope. It's a little bit older and I think we're getting a new one relatively soon. And then these two packs are two glide scope covers. And this last one is going to be our pediatric backup airways. So we've got um, our eye gels, and then we also have stuff for needle crike uh, if we end up having to. And last but not least down here is a Conterra airway roll that has everything for direct laryngoscopy. All right, so coming down to the lid of the pack here, we've got a couple mesh pockets. So up top we have our, what we call a recess bag. So this basically has our push dose pressors. So we carry phenylephrine, which is a premix stick, and then we carry everything to make a push dose epi. Uh, for our um, patients that are really hypotensive. And then in here, we've got a chest pain kit. So this one has our heparin, our uh, adenosine, and then our aspirin and nitro live in that one. Just meds that we need kind of at a moment's notice are gonna be in this bag, but this isn't the full amount of medications we carry on this helicopter. So coming into the helicopter a little bit more, you notice there's a left and a right seat. Both the nurse and paramedic will kind of trade off being in either one. Who's ever sitting right seat will be generally drawing up medications. They're gonna be doing the monitor. Uh, they'll be looking at the vent while the person sitting left seat will be attending to the patient and making sure that the meds are being given, making sure they're doing okay. Uh, and then any procedures that needs to be done, the left seat will do. In addition, the left seat also has the most flight responsibilities for clearing the tail. And they'll generally be the ones under night vision goggles if you're doing a scene flight. So behind me, we have our med wall. So this med wall mounts a couple pieces of our equipment. Uh, the first one up here is our ventilator. So patients that can't breathe um, on their own or that have a breathing tube in, we'll hook them up to this. This is the Revell ventilator. We did get the Hamiltons uh, that we'll be replacing uh, relatively soon. However, we haven't been trained on them yet, so we're holding off. 
Uh, this guy here allows us to select tidal volume, so how much air somebody's getting. Uh, it allows us to change the breath rate, give them PEEP, which is pressure in the lungs, change their FiO2, which is how much O2 we're giving them. Uh, and that has a lot of other features such as CPAP and BiPAP. It's a pretty advanced machine. Uh, this guy has a cord here, and you'll notice this oxygen tree to my uh, right. This guy can plug directly into that, and that will feed this ventilator O2. Uh, so we don't have to hook up a nasal cannula or anything, they'll just get oxygen straight into their tube. These are all on aircraft rated mounts, so if we were to get in a crash, um, these would not fly around, hit us, and cause us further injury. All right, so coming down the med wall a little bit more, we have two IV pumps. Now these IV pumps are uh, the sapphire pumps. If we are running a drip, we don't wanna be guessing at what the rate is. Uh, which is traditionally what EMS has done. So we'll put this on special drip tubing that I'll talk about in a little bit. And then this actually does our med math for us. So I'll say, we're doing this medication. It comes up in the dr dr drug library. I'll select the concentration. It will calculate it and I'll tell it exactly what I want its dose to be. Uh, pretty slick, pretty easy to use. The only issue with these is these are single channel. So I wish these they had places for two uh, because we'll routinely be transporting patients on up to eight drips at a time. Uh, and it gets pretty tangled when every drip has its individual pump that is being used. Uh, below that, there is a little bit of an empty space down here. When we transport patients on impellas or a balloon pump, so a balloon pump is basically a balloon that goes up somebody's femoral artery, sits right above their heart, and then inflates and deflates and helps pump blood throughout the rest of the body if they're in cardiogenic shock. An impella is basically a propeller uh, close to their heart that ejects blood throughout the body. We take both of those machines, they sit right here, and then we can strap them to the floor using an aircraft rated uh, webbing to make sure that is as safe as possible for us. So looking forward in the helicopter, we have our Zoll X-Series monitor. So this is a cardiac monitor. You've seen it in some of my other tours. And basically this allows us to take a blood pressure. Obviously we can't take manuals in the helicopter. We can do a Doppler that hooks up into the communication system, but it doesn't work super well. Uh, so we're relying on this to take our blood pressures. It has a pulse oximeter on it. It also has a four lead and 12 lead EKG capabilities. And then on the other compartment, we have defibrillation pads, which allow us to defibrillate a patient if they're in a shockable cardiac rhythm, or we can cardiovert them or pace them with this device. The other cool thing about this X-Series in particular is this has the ability to monitor invasive lines. So if somebody's on a balloon pump, they have an A-line in, or they have like a swan gans catheter, this will allow us to actually monitor that real time uh, and change our treatment based on their hemodynamics. Below that, and I know it's kind of hard to see, we have a couple things. So we've got an O2 tree down here that's generally for the patient, uh, but we can also hook pilot O2 or crew O2 up to this. If we're flying above 14,000 feet, which we do uh, periodically here, we need to actually hook ourselves up to O2 to make sure that we're not getting depleted. Then we also have a uh, suction module. So if the patient has an obstructed airway, they've vomited, they can't control their own airway, we'll stick that in their mouth and that will get whatever secretions uh, are out of there. And then behind that, we have our Quinflow blood warmer. So coagulopathy, so somebody stops being able to clot at about 95 degrees uh, with their body temperature. So even on a hot day like it is today, we still always warm our blood products, always warm our fluids. And that sits down here, it just has a puck that connects to it, and then we connect the IV line directly into that. So on the other side of the helicopter, we got a couple things. Uh, strapped into the side, we have our transfer bag. And once again, I've got a video going through these in depth, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on them. But this guy is just our critical care bag. It's everything we need to manage the patient for basically the entire transport if they're really sick. We've got a liter of saline here um, for our balloon pump transfers or A-lines that need to be transduced. In the main pocket here, we've got everything for nebulizers. And then in here, we've got our Quinflow package. So this has the puck that actually allows us to warm the blood. And then in this side, we have everything for our BiPAP or a CPAP for a severe um, CHF patients, anybody with a lot of pulmonary edema, and, and then like your asthmatics, things like that. That connects to the ventilator and allows us to give them ventilation without actually intubating them or putting in a uh, breathing tube. And then down below, we've got vent tubing. So this is the tube that connects the ventilator to the endotracheal tube, the breathing tube, and allows us to breathe for them. Down below, we've got a uh, cuff 
that will show us the pressure of an endotracheal tube uh, cuff in the esophagus. You don't want that too uh, high because it will actually cause some necrosis and some other issues uh, with blood flow. And down below we have an O2 accessory kit that just has connectors if the facility we're going to doesn't use the same kind of O2 hookups that we do. Uh, this is the same stat pack as the scene bag. It's the stat pack G3 backup. Uh, it's just in the black color. And then the side compartments. So this side compartment has all of our half sets. So if we're continuing a hospital's infusion, we're gonna hook the patient onto a half set. This just hicks on the end and then allows them to go to our pumps. Not many hospital systems are using the sapphires just because they're not hospital pumps, they're transport pumps. And then we also have full sets. So if we were spiking our own med, like Levofed or something like that, we'll spike the Levofed with this and flow it into the patient. The other side, has all of the tubing to transduce an A-line. So we've got our A-line tubing here, uh, and then we've got the cables to connect it to the monitor and allows us to monitor those advanced hemodynamics in the ICU setting. Under this seat, we've got a red Kintera drug bag. Um, so once again, this isn't all our meds, uh, but these are kind of everything that didn't fit in the scene bag originally. So you can see we've got a lot of stuff in here. It's not everything that's in the protocol, but I'll leave a list on the screen for you guys to take a look at some of the stuff that we're doing and carrying. We've got a lot of pressors, so your levofed, dopamine, epinephrine drips. Um, we're carrying our uh, beta blockers along with a bunch of seizure meds. Uh, you name it, we carry a little bit of everything and it's far too much to go through in this video. I will dedicate an entire video to our medications uh, at a later time that you can check out. All right, looking at this seat, this is the pilot seat right here. And here we have a bunch of different uh, compartments with kind of miscellaneous items and things we need in a hurry. So up here, we've got a bunch of tape. A lot of us will take the three inch tape, put it on our thighs of our flight suit, and then we'll take notes throughout the call for drip titra titrations or anything we're changing so we can document it in our reports later. Uh, in here we have all our cheat sheets. So on the back, these are all the plates for different airports we might have to land at. Uh, good in emergency situations and then at unfamiliar airports, it gives you kind of how to enter the pattern, how high you need to be, things like that. Uh, as the med crew, we are also part of the flight crew. So we help the pilot navigate and do what they need to do, especially in emergency situations. Uh, and then back here, we've got all our cheat sheets for the radio channels that we might have to go to and different coordinates for landing zones uh, that are pre-designated in the mountains. So as you can see, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, so we can't memorize them. We keep them on here. All right, so that tucks behind that seat neater than I did it there. Uh, in this top pocket, we've got a radio for ground contact, extra batteries for the Zoll and the ventilator in case they run out, a thermometer. In this pocket back here, we've got syringes and everything we need for med admin. Down here, we've got restraints. So if a patient is, uh, has an altered mental status, we don't want to risk them coming up the, off the cot and um, hitting the pilot or touching controls or anything. So we'll put them in these soft uh, medical restraints there just to keep them um, from harming themselves or us during flight. Sharps container. And then down here is everything we need for crew O2. So if we are flying really high, we need to throw oxygen on ourselves or on the pilot, more importantly, uh, we can do that there. And then down here, we've got a satellite phone, which just allows us to make contact with people if we're in the mountains. Uh, we don't have cell service, our radios aren't working, we can always get out on that. And I say always, but anybody that's ever used a sat phone knows that they do not work 100% of the time. We've got a bunch of sizes of gloves in there. And then last but not least, we have everything we need for suction. So we have the Ballard suction for down the endotracheal tube. We also have hard tip suction in there uh, for everybody else. Uh, right here, we've got a fire extinguisher, um, just in case the helicopter did light on fire, very unlikely occurrence. But a lot of the safety equipment we carry is actually required by the FAA and other accrediting bodies. So the last thing to talk about is going to be our radio system. So we have to be able to talk to pretty much every hospital in the area. We talk to a lot of different ground units from a lot of dif different jurisdictions. Uh, and then we need to talk to other aircraft, our dispatch, and um, basically anybody, we have to be able to talk to them. So the radio equipment on here is, there's kind of a learning curve to it. 
Um, but we also have the ability for the pilot to dial a sat phone. If we have to come in contact with certain hospitals that we don't have their frequency, we can do that as well. All right, last but not least, we have our outdoor compartments. In this one, this is the largest one. We have all of our PPE for infectious disease patients, AKA our COVID patients at the moment. Uh, in here, we've got all our disinfection stuff for the helicopter. And then we have survival equipment. So we've got flares, fire starting stuff, water purification equipment, and some food, just in case we are forced to make an emergency landing or heaven forbid crash in the mountains. We do have stuff to sustain ourselves for a couple days while help gets to us. That is all for this cabinet. It is a pretty shallow cabinet. All right, the last compartment on this aircraft I'm gonna show you is the aft compartment. Now, this is like the trunk of the helicopter. We keep a lot of our extra stuff in here. So in here, we've got kind of our extra critical care bag. This has extra vent circuits in it. It's got some extra um, capnography, everything that we need to run more than one call if we use it up front and we don't have time to get back to the hospital and restock, we keep just an extra in here. Then we have a life blanket, which is a big warm blanket. It is 95 degrees out here, so we only put it on the cot for trauma patients at the moment. Uh, a lot of patients are very uncomfortable in this, so we keep it in the aft during the summer. And then we have our extra trauma bag in there. This blue bag has our C collars, our vacuum splints, SAM splints. Uh, it also has a traction splint. Uh, as well as extra tourniquets and packing gauze for a uh, potential mass casualty. And then last but not least, in this very adorable bag, we've got an OB kit. It is near impossible to deliver a baby in the front of an A-star, so hopefully you don't have to use this in flight, and that's why we keep it in the aft. But this has our OB kit and some extra peed supplies. In addition to all of this stuff, when we get a flight, we actually pack our blood into a blood cooler, and that generally goes back here uh, unless we hear it is a trauma patient that's requiring blood. A lot of our patients don't, so it's not something that we routinely uh, keep up front with us unless we absolutely need it. And then once again, if we have our Eden monitor, which is our fetal heart rate monitor, we'll keep that back here for the portions of the flight we don't have a patient. And then when we do have a patient, we take the ventilator off and we put it on that med wall you saw earlier. Guys, that is all I have for this week's video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below and I will see you next week.